So in chapter 17, so we're back at the Variety Theater with the staff missing and the leadership position now falls to Vasily, who's the bookkeeper. And there is a new high demand for Volan's next show after word had gotten out about the last one that we saw in chapter 12. So now the authorities come to the theater um, to investigate what happened, uh, given the mayhem that erupted after the show. Um, they bring their best search dog, who uh, got a whiff of the place, and then eventually uh, he ended up jumping out of the window um, for fear, which is showing how Bulgakov is saying that animals are also in tune to uh, evil in the atmosphere. So then Vasily has to go to this uh, place that is named the Commission of Spectacles and Entertainment of the Lighter Type um, to report on the events and the live gate. So the name here shows uh, kind of how drab and boring uh, the bureaucracy holding up the theater is, despite the whole point of the theater, which is to be something fun and entertaining and not boring. So this is another obvious gen that Bulgakov is taking about um, how entertainment worked in Soviet society. So now it takes a while for Vasily to get a taxi cab because the drivers don't trust the money that they're being given by the people because it keeps turning into other things like bottle labels and bees. There's an incident where um, one customer pays a taxi driver and then the dollar bills turn into a bee and sting him on the hand. So uh, this is kind of a trope where the Antichrist has infected the monetary system of the society and is sowing discord through currency. So uh, when he finally arrives at the commission, um, the secretary there, Anna, is freaking out because of what happened to the chairman. So all people can see uh, is an empty suit doing paperwork. Um, and it's not hard to see what Volgakov is doing here, uh, basically showing a metaphor for all state workers as just being empty suits doing paperwork. But it turns out that Behemoth, the cat, barged into the office, and when the chairman said, uh, get out or devil take me, the cat simply said, okay, consider it done. And uh, he was thus replaced by a suit, an empty suit, doing paperwork. Um, so it's kind of a disturbing image. Now, just as Berlioz, in the beginning of the book, the chairman uh, took the devil's name in vain, so to speak, um, superficially and had a demonic revelation. Though Vasily then goes to another room and he sees groups of workers wandering around uh, singing Soviet anthems mindlessly against their own will, which is um, a more obvious satire for state-controlled culture. When the doctor arrives to uh, help with what is um, being naturally explained as mass hypnosis. One of the staff members says that the choir master in the checkered trousers appeared and taught everybody how to sing. So uh, basically Koroviev came into this commission and um, mostly hijacked everyone's free will and showed them how to sing. So he's almost like a demonic choir master in this regard. Um, um, soon enough, the authorities send vehicles to transport everybody to the psych ward because they're all, they've all gone crazy. When Vasily goes to the financial department to deposit the theater's live gate, it all turns into foreign currency and he ends up being arrested. Um, just how in Chapter 9, when Nikonor Ivanovich got pinched for having foreign currency that wasn't really his, so now Vasily is being caught in the same trap. And just as how in previous chapters, the system um, makes status very, very fragile. So within seconds, somebody can go from being a significant person who is official to somebody who is unofficial. So uh, next we have chapter 17. 18. Uh, yes, you're right, 18. Um, yeah, I misnumbered that. Thank you. So then the narrative now um, changes uh, to um, Kiev, where Berlioz's uncle lives, 
and uh, Maximilian gets a telegram from Berlioz, who's now dead, uh, telling him that he got run over by a train and that his funeral is going to be in Moscow Friday at 3 p.m. When he goes to the city, he's not going there to mourn. He's actually going there to claim Berlioz's apartment because he's kind of a, a weaselly character. So um, this character was actually alluded to earlier in the story by Volin. Um, at this time in the 1930s, Russian people were actually restricted from owning their own property, so everybody had to rent. And on top of that, um, there was also a housing crisis going on, and this apartment was vacant. So there was a, a high demand uh, for this apartment, and uh, Maximilian uh, wants to um, take advantage of that. So when he arrives at the apartment... He meets Behemoth, um, because as we know, that the devil and his minions have taken a presence in Berlioz's apartment. Um, he also meets Koroviev there, and uh, Koroviev is pretending to cry over Berlioz's death. And he's um, almost like mocking the fact that Berlioz died, while at the same time mocking the fact that Maximilian isn't mourning at all, really. So, uh, yeah, there's a couple layers of hypocrisy going on there. So he asks who sent the telegram, and Korovia points to the giant talking cat, and he says he sent it. And uh, there's more absurdist humor here when the cat is dialoguing with Maximilian, and Behemoth also demands to see uh, Maximilian's passport. Um, Behemoth uh, sees the passport and doesn't like what he sees, and uh, he summons Azazelo uh, to see Maximilian off. Um, and uh, when he does this, he actually hits him in the head with a roast chicken so hard that he falls down the stairs and uh, runs away in terror. So just like with the financial director's dream in the asylum in, in Chapter 15, um, where uh, his sin was put on display and he was humiliated over it, Maximilian kind of walks into a trap due to his own selfishness, and uh, he gets knocked down a flight of stairs with a roast chicken. So on his way, so um, now on his way out, he, he passes a man named uh, Andre Sopov, who is the theater bartender. He's actually on his way up to the apartment as well to see Woland. So he he's on his way up, and uh, he's trying to file a complaint that. Um, the bar's profits have been plummeting due to fake money that came from Volin's show. Um, Hella actually greets him at the door and uh, brings him to Voland. When he complains to Voland, uh, Voland actually turns the complaint back on him by criticizing the food at the theater, calling it uh, second fresh, where which is um, another jab at the Soviet Union because there is no such thing as second fresh. It's um, kind of an arbitrary grade um, that is given to food. And Voland is kind of pointing this out. He's like, it's either fresh or it's not. But it's second fresh is kind of a weird um, delusional idea. Um, and uh, sometimes the Soviet Union would come up with words like these to waive responsibility for rotten food because there were also food shortages in uh, Ukraine in the 1930s at this time. Um, so when Andre um, presses Voland on the issue of the counterfeit bills, Voland invites him to sit down and, uh, and the stool collapses out from underneath him and uh, he spills wine all over himself. And at this point, um, I think it says a weird owl flies in and uh, lands on the mantelpiece. So what's interesting is like when Andre first walks in here, the place is super pretty. It smells like a church. It's really nice. Um, and then as his conversation with Volan goes on, the atmosphere in the room and gets darker and darker and weirder and weirder things keep happening. So Volan then offers Andre a drink and uh, offers him to play a game of cards, but Andre refuses. And Volan doesn't like this. And he says that only those who... Um, don't play games are rather cynical and uh, ill inside, I guess you could say. So Andre then continues to press Volan on the question about fake bills that people are trying to buy drinks with, 
and he talks about how the, uh, the 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 change that they give people back is real money. Uh, so Volan becomes a very well, Volan becomes very transparent and um, admits that uh, even though the people uh, thought they were coming to see him, he was actually coming to see them. He wants to see them sin and fall and everything. Um, Volan then asks Andre if the citizens are crooks, and Andre admits that some of them are, and Volan then asks how much money uh, Andre has, and uh, Koroviev actually answers the question for him, and he gets it totally right. And Volan then tells Andre that it doesn't matter anyway, because he's going to die of cancer in nine months. And uh, this is where uh, the chapter goes rather dark because Andre is not really a bad guy. He's actually he's actually conducted himself in a very humble manner in this in this chapter so far. So we know this because uh, Volan didn't have to really exploit any sin of his. He just uh, he just defiled his spirit by um, uh, telling him when he's going to die. So um, when Hella sees Andre out because he's about to leave. Um, uh, he uh, he notices that his hat uh, it doesn't fit right, and then it turns into a black kitten, uh, scratches his head, and then uh, runs back up the stairs. And uh, this chapter really kind of shows the cruelty of the demons, so we can get into that later. Um, so Andre then goes to a doctor because um, he he took a he took it very seriously when Volan said that he might die of cancer. This is in stark contrast to Berlioz earlier in the book, who doubted everything. When Volan told him he was going to die, he didn't even care. He didn't believe any of it. Um, what's interesting is Andre is a relatively uh, humble man, and he was one of the only ones who, who could recognize uh, supernatural threats. So another weird thing that happens is when Andre pays the doctor. Um, the bills actually turn into uh, bottle labels uh, rather than um, rather than money, um, just how everybody else's money did. Um, but he was willing to pay in gold as well. So he it, it also shows too he's somewhat of an honest man. Um, now what's interesting is after he leaves the doctor's office, um, the the camera shall we say shifts to the doctor. And then when the doctor goes into his office, he sees a sparrow like flies and lands on uh, his desk and a gramophone starts playing music. And the sparrow actually like, starts dancing to the music in a very weird, eerie way. And then it ends up uh, flying over um, to his graduation picture and just breaks it. And uh, I think this bird could very well be Voland in the form of a bird because there's also a bird in the pilot narrative. Um, and I think we could be seeing the same thing here as like a plot device to tie both of the narratives together. Um, so that is mostly the summary in uh, chapter one. Um, this marks the end of book one, actually. And, um, and book two is about to start. We're about to meet Margarita in the next chapter. Um, and the narrative actually... Uh, addresses the reader directly and says, uh, we're going to move on and meet Margarita. Um, so this is the, this is the summary. So I guess we'll start with um, chapter 17. And uh, we'll discuss that. <clears throat> okay. Do you have a point you want to discuss first or? Well, I did have some additional notes here. I mean, was there anything that stood out to you while I find them? Um, well, uh, one thing that's interesting, like in the beginning of the chapter, how we see there's a there's a long queue formed for the next night's show. Yeah, it's interesting because at this point we kind of know that it's gotten around town that this black magic show is happening, and people probably know what happens. You know, I mean, I wouldn't expect people to keep quiet about money raining from the sky and people giving out free clothes and stuff, or even the inverse, that the, the money was fake or that the the women's clothing was fake. And then all that ruckus that ensued afterwards, like, so it's kind of interesting because if people would have heard the bad thing, 
why would they show up for the show? And if they heard the good thing, it makes sense to show up. So I'm just kind of wondering what people are thinking there. Like, are they showing up for the spectacle of the whole thing or are they showing up because they want the, the actual belongings that the other, um, theater goers got the previous night? Yeah. I think either way it's sparking the curiosity of the people because I mean, even if money was raining from the sky and it turned out to be fake, people wouldn't, people want to know like how that works or like it's yeah. even possible. Um, yeah um or maybe they think that they're smarter than now they know the secret they're they're more prepared than the people mm -hmm. the night before or something yeah yeah i just thought that was interesting because yeah. i think if it was me and i heard about that i probably wouldn't want to go i think that like i would just think oh you know if all the money you got was fake then it's not worth going and if it if it was real, I guess it would be worth going, but like knowing how much chaos ensued, you know, yeah, it's kind of I mean, weird. I would not. Yeah. Meant, would you want to go to that show knowing all that we know now? Well, yeah. I mean, I guess I would have two thoughts on that. First one is one thing that Bulgakov is doing here is he's kind of showing also not just the absurdity of the Soviet government, but also the people at the time. Um, and so maybe people would be crazy enough to go to that. Um, and the other thought that I had was um, one of the issues that they were having is that um, and the taxi driver brought this up and Andre the bartender brought this, brought this up, where people are taking the fake money and they're spending it on things. And then the change that they get back is real money. Mm -hmm. So that could be a problem too like that could be a reason why people are going it's like it's like i had a friend back in the day like he used to scan 20s and then he would put the 20 dollar bill in like an empty bag of chips and throw a handful of gravel in there and shake it up and then go to mcdonald's and buy something off the dollar menu and then get like 19 dollars of real money back and like that's exactly what these people are doing with this fake devil money right so it's like destabilizing the monetary system in russia um and it's causing people to go broke, which is kind of what the bartender's thing is. That's why he was going to lodge a complaint. But then the interesting thing is, and I don't want to jump too far ahead into chapter 18 yet, but obviously it winds up being that he's not broke. He has a ton of money. Hmm. At least I, I don't know how rubles equate, but I had like 200 some thousand in the bank. If he had like five different banks. Yeah. Like said, yeah, and and also money hidden in his floorboards at home. So it's like he's he's not broke, but he's still trying to get that. He, he said he was like 109 rubles short, and he's like willing to go to the length to make sure he gets his 109 rubles, even though he has all that money stashed mm -hmm. away. So, uh, like I said, I don't want to go too far ahead, but I think if anything, the one thing you can accuse the bartender of is maybe a little greed. Yeah, maybe like he has money, but he's willing to nickel and dime over small amounts. Um, because otherwise, he seems like a good character. Well, I was gonna say it could be integrity, though, because like it's not really his money that he's pocketing; that's the theater's money. That is true. Yeah, because it, it, otherwise, he seems like a good kind of character. Mm -hmm. Like we can talk more about him in a little bit. Yeah, um, I would say the thing that kind of stood out to me about Chapter Seventeen is like despite all of the hierarchy and all the, the orderliness that the Soviet Union boasts, like everything is in chaos and yeah, just the fragility of the bureaucracy. I mean, all it takes is like somebody spending fake money and now it's like the public transportation system is all messed up and, and the theater can't, can't uh, report their live gate and like everything is just to completely destabilized. Um, and, uh, I think that like one of the real standouts for this book is the demonology and the antichrist figure, because like the antichrist figure isn't just going to tempt people to sin. Like he's going to infect the whole system. He's infecting the government. He's inf infected, I guess what then would have been the media, um, literally like the medium between the people and the government. And, uh, now he's infected the monetary system and, um, it's just causing more chaos and it's bringing the worst out of people. Um, 
so you know, fake money is so in discord and the, the other interesting thing too is like the the empty suit that's um exhibiting the behavior of an angry ceo i think that's like it's so on the nose and usually i don't like things that are really on the nose but i don't mind this because um like it's one of those subject matters where like you don't have to be subtle about it it's like everybody knows that a lot of these uh bureaucrats are totally soulless and they might as well just be suits doing paperwork and that's yeah. exactly what Bongakov reduced the CEO. And it's hard to say. It's it's a weird kind of thing because he doesn't really overtly state whether he's actually gone and it's just his suit that remains or if he's like invisible. Like I think that it took him away, that he's a soulless suit. Yeah. But it's like either way, he's representing the fact that, you know, like you said, he's just a suit. He, even in with all this craziness going on, he just reverts back to his duty. Yeah. Which is just, he like, he could care less about everything else going on. He's just, he needs to make sure he, he does his job. Uh, yeah. It's just really interesting. It, it's like, yeah, it completely, like, in a very tangible way, way, reduces him to his work. Like, you are no longer a human being. You are... Uh, you are a cog in the machine. You are your job. You are a means to an end on end in and of yourself. And that's kind of what he was. I mean, I guess we don't really know for sure because they don't really flesh out this character that much. But based on the behavior that we see from the suit, if that's supposed to be an extension of who he was before he became a an empty suit doing paperwork, then um, in a way, that's kind of what he's always been. Well, it's interesting, too, because he's uh, he's the obvious representation of that. But then the other people in the building are still kind of doing their jobs too. Like they're kind of freaking out a bit and they're kind of pulling their hair out going, I don't know what's going on, but like the receptionist is still being a receptionist. Well, like when they walk in, she's still, she's still doing her job as a receptionist, even though her boss is just a floating suit. Like she's not going above and beyond to try to figure out what's going on. So I think that's kind of like a minor representation of that. Yeah. Of people just doing doing their duty basically or doing their jobs. Um and not really having so much of a thought process behind it. Yeah, and uh we see we see that too when um Vasily goes into the next building full of a whole bunch of workers and they're just like walking around singing mindlessly, like mindlessly singing um, anthems of the Soviet Union. And what, what I found weird about that is like, like the church has always taught that the voice is uh, the instrument that's like made by God for humans. And it's at its best when it's being used willingly for, you know, liturgical chanting, worship, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But what Korovyev does as the choir master, you know, major air quotes, is he kind of like subverts that and is making people sing the praises of man almost against their will. Like just people walking around like mindless mouthpieces, uncontrollably singing. Which is, I think you mentioned it in your summary, it's like, that is a a parallel to Soviet life, like, you being forced to being a Soviet patriot, right? Like, you can't speak yeah. out against the state, you have to sing the, the national anthem, or, you know, whatever, you can't question anything, you just have to go with the flow and say what they want you to say and do what they want you to do. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and it's even interesting too because at one point they mention in passing that they're loading up truckloads of these people to take to the mental asylum. Yep, and even the people who are driving the trucks who are showing up on the scene to load people up to take to the mental asylum, they start singing, mm -hmm. which is pretty funny. I mean, all this stuff is like my kind of humor. I love absurdist mm -hmm. humor. I just like. I was freaking up reading this. So, mm -hmm. um, one thing I wanted to go back to also that was at the beginning of the chapter mm -hmm. you mentioned was about the dog. Yeah. Yeah. The ace of diamonds. How animals have kind of like a, 
like an innate sense of spiritual things, mm -hmm. despite not actually having like, or at least as far as we know, they don't have like the faculties to mm -hmm. like interact with spiritual stuff. Like they don't have a noose or right. something, yeah. you know, w yet we as humans, we have that faculty and yet it's like clouded, mm -hmm. like, but animals don't even have it as far as we know. And they have an easier time being able to detect this stuff. And that's something that you'll see in a lot of different, you know, uh, pop culture and other stories. So do you have anything else on that? Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, St. Gregory Palamas does teach that animals have souls. They're just not like human souls. They're mm -hmm. animal souls. So, um, and the fact that, um, they like we have saints who have become you know best friends with animals like, like the obvious example like saint seraphim Sarah mm -hmm. with his bears but also like saint erasmus with his lions and saint paisios and his snakes and all that like um animals can sense holiness too apparently um and if they can sense holiness they can also sense evil and i think bulgakov is kind of leaning into that here um so yeah i kind of appreciated him doing that, that like the dog and, and there's like actually a couple paragraphs about the dog where the yeah. dog is like, you know, kind of reluctant. Like he almost treats the dog like the dog has a personality of its own. Like the dog gets scared for a second, but then like pushes through his fear, and then eventually he just uh, loses it and then runs off. Um, um, the last thing I have really for s chapter seventeen is mm -hmm. about Vasily kind of falling to the same fate as Nikonor Ivanovich. Mm -hmm. But it's weird because Nick Norovanovich accepted a bribe. Mm -hmm. And then I think Volin tricked him by turning, like he gave him rubles. But then once he hid the rubles, Volin somehow transformed him into foreign currency. Whereas in Vasily's case, it wasn't like a bribe. That was his own, that was the theater's money yeah. that he had taken um, to the bank to, mm -hmm. to deposit. Mm -hmm. or whatever and so it wasn't like he was doing something bad with that money or he was breaking the norm he just got caught out and i'm wondering if that's just because it was associated with the theater and all the stuff volan did with the theater money uh, yeah i was trying to figure that out because i couldn't understand the exact parallel between the two characters or why they would have mm -hmm. that same fate yeah, well, we could definitely go back to that, but I think that's a good segue into the next chapter because, I mean, my thesis on these two chapters is that, like, the demons are getting really, really, like, just straight up cruel. Like, before, it's almost like they would pick on people who already had sin problems. Like, they already had ego problems, power problems, unbelief, um, and then the demons would just kind of exploit that. And then um, it would be that person's downfall. But now it's like what they're starting to do is they're starting to damage people who aren't even doing anything wrong. And I think that Vasily, like just being the bookkeeper, he doesn't even know where Veronuka Rimsky are. He's just kind of like, oh, I guess this leadership position falls to me. Like, as far as I could tell, he never really did anything really bad. Um, but it's almost like the infection, the demonic infection of the atmosphere of the city is spreading to everybody, including him. And so it's almost like the, these people are just getting indiscriminately hurt now. Yeah. I think too, there's like a sub theme of power in the Soviet union being not that powerful. Like you're actually sticking your neck out there, like the position of power in the theater falls to him and then he becomes like the scapegoat. Like mm -hmm. he's in charge now, but he also then by the end is in trouble for the foreign money. So it's like, you know, being someone in charge in the Soviet Union is actually not that good. Yeah. And cause you could arbitrarily just get in trouble, even if you're innocent. And I mean, and Bulgakov is really leaning into that. Like a lot of people who got in trouble in the Soviet Union did nothing wrong. Like, and even the people who did do something wrong, it's like the consequences were just so astronomical. Like in, in the Gulag Archipelago, like Alexander Solzhenitsyn tells a story of a guy who stole a ball of yarn and he was sent to a prison camp for stealing like 200 meters of sewing material or something. So they would just have these bizarre, arbitrary ways of like wording everything. 
to get people in as much trouble as humanly possible, even if what they did wasn't even that bad. Um, and uh, I mean, I think the other sub theme here is he's basically saying the Soviet Union is run by the devil. Um, and it's fragile. Um, so even though everything comes off as very strong and orderly and like, it doesn't take much to destabilize the whole thing. Um, and, uh, so yeah, but in the next chapter though, um, Andre, there's the bartender who doesn't really have any position of leadership. He just serves drinks. He goes to meet Bolin and also, um, Berlioz's uncle, Max, Maximilian goes there too. Um, did you have any thoughts about Maximilian and what he's doing? Yeah, I mean, he makes his position very clear. He's like, under normal circumstances, I wouldn't even bother going to my nephew's yes. funeral, which is pretty brutal. Um, but he cares specifically because property isn't something like, people don't own property. So, like, the only way he can get this apartment, which would be very advantageous for him, is to go there and claim it. And so he figures, why not do that? So he's very clearly a, a selfish individual. Um, and to be honest, like he's, he kind of gets off light. Like he does mm -hmm. get beaten and stuff, but like, yeah, at least by the end of the chapter, he's not like dead or in an insane asylum, yeah. you know? Um, but yeah. 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 He's, um, what I think, what I found kind of sort of funny, um, was when Korovyev comes there and he's like crying into a tissue and he's like, it's so sad that he died. And then he goes into all these graphic descriptions like, oh, I witnessed yeah. it. His head just got severed and oh, the right leg, what a sound it made when it got crunched. And then, you know, like, and, it, and he kept repeating like crunched into or something yeah. like that or, but it's interesting because like, who's, who, who talks like that? Who's actually sad? Yeah, well, it's very clear he's faking it, but it's interesting because I think he's only faking it because uh, Maximilian is not being like he's not mourning at all. Yeah, he's like so. He, in a way, he's trying to like make him feel bad because a random stranger is more upset than the uncle of the deceased person. Yeah, it's like it's like he's trying to put a mirror in front of his soul, but at the same time, though. It's not in a way it doesn't work because it, it's like I said, there's multiple layers of hypocrisy with it because the demon itself is mocking him for not being sad. But at the same time, the demon isn't really sad either. So he's trying to put a mirror in front of his soul and like make him feel bad and convict him. But he can't really do that because he himself isn't sad. And also, even if he were trying to convict him to actually have a heart, he doesn't even want him to anyway. So it's and as soon weird. as Maximilian starts, because I think it says like he starts to tear up a bit. As soon as he starts to do that, his mind immediately goes back to the apartment because then he says mm -hmm. something like, well, what if this guy's here to claim the apartment? And then he's yeah. right back to business like about the apartment. Yeah. You know, so he's it's like he almost gets affected by it and then he pulls himself back into his selfishness. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I personally have called this chapter the chapter of gaslighting <laughs> because, um, that is what, um, the demons keep doing. Like the, uh, um, yeah, um, the, so the interaction that I found really interesting in this chapter though was, um, Andre. Um, because this is, I think, the first time where we see someone who's kind of, who doesn't seem like he already has a lot of issues with sin, um, encounter the devil and look at how the devil treats him. It's, um, it's very interesting. Um, and, uh, he goes in and, and, uh, he's asking all these questions saying like, okay, like, um, people keep buying this money with fake currency and then they keep taking our change. And so, like the bar's not making money or losing money when people buy our stuff, which is kind of weird. And, um, and every time the devil kind of, uh, tries to, to, um, sidebar the question, he always says, Oh, forgive me, but that's not why I'm here. Or when he tries to 
evade the question and start another conversation. He'll always start, oh, well, well forgive me. I, I, I'm here to ask this question. He's always like super nice to him and he's super humble about everything. Yeah, and he denies Volan in almost every request, you know? Mm -hmm. Like whether the request is absurd or not that absurd, he's, he like almost always denies it. Yeah, like he, I think he like spills wine on him and then like he's like, why don't you take your pants off and let him dry in front of the fire? He's like, yeah, no thanks. Right, which is a logical thing. Like, why why would you do that in front of a stranger? But Volan has this effect on people where he can, like, make them do absurd things, but it doesn't affect Andre. Like, he doesn't do an absurd thing when you would expect that he would because everybody else has been. Um, additionally, like, Volan offers to play all these gambling games, mm -hmm. you know, which is known to be a vice. Yeah. Um, and he turns them all down, like dice, cards, all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Um, so we know he's not a gambler. And even though he's a bartender, he's like, I don't drink. So he's not, he doesn't indulge himself overly. Mm -hmm. And, uh, he, he like turns down Hella's advances, mm -hmm. which it's written that she's like a beautiful woman and he just like doesn't really care. Mm -hmm. He's like semi bashful around her and he, he's trying to be modest and things like that. So. Clearly, it's trying to show that he's not affected by Volan. And something I think is interesting is multiple times, I think at least two or three times, it's mentioned that he does a sign of the cross. Mm, yeah. Um, so that was something I noted down. Something I had, too, with regards to you bring up the games and everything. Um, the devil likes games because there has to be a winner and a loser. And um, there has to be there have to, has to be winners and losers for the game to work, um, and this kind of clues us into why Voland is okay allowing some good, because I mean he needs it. Otherwise, the evil itself won't work. And that's something that it kind of confused me earlier in the book. Is sometimes he'll say like, "No, you should believe in the devil. You should get this one thing correct," or um, like they have Yashua. Uh, refuse the sponge and give it to the thief on the cross in his version of the gospel story. So, like, it's almost like the devil isn't totally opposed to doing good. And uh, he certainly is not opposed to exposing people's sin. But in order for his evil to actually work, there has to be some good to undermine. Otherwise, there's no point in being evil. And, uh, of course, that reminded me of Lewis talking about how, like, the devil is a fallen angel because all the things it takes to be evil are actually good things, but they have to be twisted in a way like it takes you know good looks charm being articulate all of those things are helpful in um getting evil tasks accomplished but those things in and of themselves aren't bad um right it's almost like well we know this but there's rules to the way the universe operates and the devil has to operate by the rules so like it, to him it is almost like a game so when he encounters someone who's good, it's it's like more interesting for him because he's trying to get them to to do the the wrong thing, but he can only do it within the rules that exist. Mm -hmm. Like he can't just outright make somebody do something bad. Yeah. Um, the in the beginning of the chapter two. Um, or not chapter two, but this chapter. There is something, I noted it down, and I don't really know what to think about it, but there is a reference to um, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina, which is kind of a, a romance novel with all kinds of like uh, love triangles and love yeah. squares and love pentagrams and everything. Well, like I wanted to bring that up too. I was hoping Hannah and Jacob would be here because mm -hmm. I know Jacob said he had read um, that novel. Mm hmm and I just found this weekend that they had made a movie about it mm. in like 2008 or something like that with um, Kira Knightley, who plays Anna Karenina. Yeah, it's would be kind of interesting to watch that sometime. Yeah, I mean that's what I mean. I can't say anything about the movie. I do know that the book is like 800 pages long, though. So it would be interesting. It would be interesting to watch that sometime. Bulgakov was influenced by these writers. 
Um, the other weird thing, too, about this chapter is notice how they're addressing Voland as Messiah. Um, if that's not a dead giveaway that he's an Antichrist figure, I don't know what is. Um, and uh, the other interesting thing, too, is um, when Andre walks into the church, or when he walks into the room, he thought that it was, it was so well prepared, it was so ornate and so pleasing with aromas and beauty that he thought that um, there could be some church services for Berlioz's soul going on in this apartment. But then he instantly kicks that thought out of his mind because he's like, no, there's no way these kinds of things don't happen around here anymore. That's crazy. Mm. Um, but I really appreciated how Bulgakov kind of started the scene that way. And then like, as the chair breaks, as the wine spills, um, as Andre continues to frustrate Volin by not feeding into his games, um, the atmosphere starts getting darker and things start getting weirder and um, everything starts to become a little bit more ominous. Um, I think that is kind of like a, an encapsulation or a microcosm of how um, the demonology in this book works. Yeah, and you're right too. When when all else fails, when Volan can't um, can't convince him to do anything wrong, he basically just tells him about his death. Yeah, he just basically turns immediately to like, all right, well then I'm just gonna scare you. Like, here you go. Yeah, I mean, that, that's we're really out of character almost. Yeah, at this point because. Well, I, I mean, at this point, we haven't really seen another good character, like another character who ha doesn't have all these issues. So we don't know if it's out of character, but it seems like it is because, you know, he hasn't done it before. Yeah, he's definitely the first good character to interact with Volan. But, um, yeah, it, it's... And I wonder if that's because, like, maybe in Volan's mind or in Bulgakov's mind that when people are confronted with their mortality, they are more susceptible to doing bad things. Hmm. Like maybe that maybe Volan says that in the hopes that then he'll break him into doing something bad because he does go to the liver doctor then. But like, like you said, he even like tries to honestly pay him. Mm -hmm. Like he doesn't try to, you know, do anything fishy or anything like that. Yeah. Um, and he, he takes the threat seriously, whereas most people didn't. But he's also one of the first brave characters we see mm -hmm. because he goes back to the apartment for his hat. Right. And, yeah. and, uh, most of the characters we've seen at this point are not like that. Though, if, if they're fortunate enough to not go to the mental institution or be killed, they run. They don't go back. Well, interestingly enough, in Chapter 14, Rimsky forgot his hat and didn't go back for it because he was scared. So you're right. That's very true. Um, but I do think that, um, that's why I said, like, I think like, the tone of the demons has, has shifted a little bit because, like, I mean, in some senses, they're still hilarious. But um, sometimes, like, they're getting... They're just getting downright mean at this point. Like Voland has never um, basically just like, uh, I guess, I guess uh, taunted somebody. Like he did predict Berlioz's death, but it, it was different than he did with this man. Because um, this man, it's like he, because he couldn't break him. He just says, you know what, you're going to die, which is weird because this whole thing might be a lie, right? Because he says, you're going to die of liver cancer. But the guy never drank a drop. So right. um, it could just be more gaslighting. And the other nasty thing, too, I noticed about this chapter. Like, this is the very first chapter because, like, where I legitimately did not like Bolin. Because in the other ones, it's like, you know, he's the devil. You know, you're supposed to hate him. But, like, he's kind of charming and funny. This was the very first chapter where I thought to myself, I want to hit this guy. Because the way he was gaslighting Andre, like, every time... Andre would bring a legitimate concern to him saying like, okay, you put this show on, people are buying our drinks with your money and it's not real money. Immediately, he's, he tries to turn the tables on him and say, oh, well, 
how do you know these people aren't crooks? Are there crooks in Moscow? And he's like, well, yeah, but like, you know, there's levels to it. Like, like there's no way that every single person who bought a drink could be a crook. Um, and, uh, he also tries to tell him, um, like every time he, he gets questioned on something legitimate, he tries to turn everything around on him. And, uh, you know, it reminds me kind of of how like certain people who like, um, like one of the, you know, how one of the, the staples of abuse is somebody who can't or refuses to really, um, acknowledge their own faults and gaslights the other person. Like I'm thinking specifically about like, maybe, uh, say you have a man in a household, he's an alcoholic and say his wife says, stop drinking. And, um, he says, well, okay, fine. I agreed to stop drinking. And then two weeks later, there's like a bottle of Jack stuffed in the back of the pantry or something. And then she finds it. And then he says like, and she's like, I thought you agreed that you weren't going to drink anymore. Like, what's this year? And he's like, well, that's not mine. And it's like, well, I mean, you left the receipt on the table uh, that says that's yours. He's like, yeah, well, I told you I wasn't going to drink anymore. Like, don't you trust me? What's the point of making promises to you if you're not going to trust me? I feel like you don't even want to cooperate here and make this work. And then he turns the gun on on her. And as I'm reading this chapter with Voland and this this bartender, like, that's kind of what he's doing. Every time the bartender asks him a legitimate question, he turns the gun on him and tries to make it seem like he's in the wrong for asking the question. Mm. And uh, it's... That's why I call this the gaslighting chapter, because <laughs> um, that's what we're seeing from from Volan. Um, and uh, yeah, that was definitely um, I think what stood out to me the most in this chapter. It is also interesting, like how he mentions about how he he only staged the show just because he wanted to watch people. Okay. One. He just wanted to sit on the stage and watch everybody else react to all the craziness mm -hmm. that he knew was going to happen, you know? Yeah. Which is kind of, that's kind of how I would see the devil in reality, mm -hmm. like just wanting to cause chaos and then watch it all unfold and see how people react to stuff. Yeah. Right. And like with how they react to the money. And like, this is, this is another gaslighting example is when, um, Andre says like, these bills are fake. Um, Bolin says, quote, surely they didn't think the bills were real. They didn't do this on purpose, did they? And it's like, well, what do you think, man? Like, did you like act, you're saying like you, you, like you didn't think that like you accidentally made fake money that looks real rain from the sky on the crowd and no one would try to spend it. Like, yeah. Um, and so, yeah. This, um, yeah. The other note I had here is, um, yeah, it just, um, when, uh, Andre goes to the doctor, goes to the liver doctor. He refuses to drink the vodka that the doctor offers him, just like he refused to drink with, with Bolin. So um, um, that's why I think that this was kind of like an empty threat or an empty prophecy. Um, and, uh, Do you have any other thoughts about that? I think I had a couple more notes here, but um, um, no, I do think it's interesting that when he goes back for his hat, Andre gets mauled by that cat, so mm -hmm. he has to wrap his head up. Mm -hmm. So that forces him to walk around like a crazy person because obviously he has this weird account, and now he's walking around with a head wrap on. People think he's like been in some kind of accident where he has a head injury or something mm -hmm. you know no one wants to believe him or people think he's really crazy without even hearing him out right because yeah. he actually is a reliable character mm -hmm. and so they have to do this extra thing to make him look even more unreliable sure um, but it is interesting that the doctor regardless of all that does the test like he doesn't call you know the psych ward or something he actually 
checks them out and he orders a urinalysis and mm -hmm. whatever. And the doctor's also interesting too, because he says, pay me what you want. Like he's not like trying to gouge him or anything for the appointment. Um, right. Yeah. The doctor was pretty, um, but then, legitimate about then they start messing with the doctor, which is kind mm -hmm. of a weird turn of events culminating in the bird dancing around mm -hmm. it's a dancing like a drunk which is hilarious to yeah. think about a bird dancing like a drunk on <laughs> on the doctor's desk yeah but i was starting to think about the previous not the previous chapter but chapter 16 and how there was the bird with like during the pontius Pilate story yeah and I'm starting to think that maybe the bird has fallen in disguise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think that's true. Because it seems like there's always a bird around mm -hmm. when when that stuff's happening. Um, which I didn't think previously when I read Chapter 16. I was actually starting to think that Rat Killer was like possessed or something mm. because of the way it was describing him mm -hmm. like how he's like almost supernaturally like he doesn't he doesn't need a wet towel in the heat mm -hmm. and he's like seeming so tough like he can just stand guard all day and yeah. it just seems like he's this unnatural human you know mm -hmm. and i was like oh maybe that's volan just in like a disguise or something mm -hmm. but now i'm starting to think that it, he was actually a bird or whatever and Rat Killer is just like a really tough centurion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I can't, I'm trying to remember in chapter two if the bird is there too. Well, that's a good point. I was thinking about that. And I think when they go out on the balcony, I think there's birds. Yeah. I think it mentions them. I'd have to go back and double check that. But I mean, just off the top of my head, I think there was birds mentioned on the balcony, which is interesting because one of the quotes Volan says in that the previous chapter to Berlioz and um, Ivan is like, I was on the balcony with Pontius Pilate and the rabbi, mm. you know, so yeah. that's kind of an interesting point. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm pretty confident the bird is Voland <laughs> given, especially given the absurdity. I mean, you know, birds don't act like that in real life. So um, but yeah, but yeah, those were my notes. Um, did you have any closing thoughts? Not really, except that now we're going into book two. Yep. So we'll see how it goes. About we'll, to, meet, we'll meet Margarita. Yeah, we're about to meet Bulgakov's third wife. I mean, Margarita, you know. <laughs> and I think it's interesting that they put this delineation right here. Yeah, because it's just been mayhem up to this point. Yeah, so clearly... There's going to be a turning point or like a change in what goes on. Mm -hmm. So, but I've thoroughly enjoyed the absurdity of everything. It's it's a fun read. Mm -hmm. um, you don't see this type of comedy often, right? So, yeah, yeah. Anarchy does make for some pretty good humor, um, and it, it is also very much a. Uh, yeah, like I, I do like how nebulous this genre is because, like, it's a little bit of horror, a little bit of comedy, a little bit of drama, a little bit of satire. Um, well, a lot of satire, actually. Um, but it's layered, though, because it's almost like the, the satire that is directed at the Soviet Union could also um, double as demonology. And I, I really do think that um, even though the demons are here to kind of like bend the fabric of this system to hilarious results um, in a very real way, Bulgakov is actually conflating the the Soviet system with demonology. Because I, mean, I do believe that he thought demons were what was behind it. So, yeah, but yeah, I'm looking forward to the next chapter and uh, meeting Margarita. And um, I'm moving forward with the story because um, as far as I can tell, the, the tone is about to change a little bit from here to this point where we've been introduced to the, the anarchy entourage of the devil. Um, and now I think we're, we're going to start getting into some characters that aren't just paragons. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
That'll be good. Yep. You uh, and yep. Yeah. We can end that. Say prayer for the Panagia and then grab wings. 